Hi, good evening. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes, waiting for everybody to log in from the waiting room. Alrighty, it is 6.03, we're gonna get started. Uh, I'd like to say good evening and thank you for joining us for this first in our webinar series of addressing pediatric respiratory issues. Tonight's webinar focuses on the management of pediatric outpatient asthma in the COVID-19 era. I'm Cassie Pulse, the physician liaison with the University of Maryland Children's Hospital. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to go over. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the chat box feature. Aaron Rummel, our pediatric marketing manager, will be monitoring the chat box, and Dr. Lasso will answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. Please note that this seminar will be recorded, and an email link, and an email with the link to this recording will be sent out next week. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Anna Lasso. Dr. Lasso is an assistant professor of pediatrics for the University of Maryland School of Medicine and division head of pediatric pulmonology, allergy, and sleep. She went to medical school at the University of Panama School of Medicine and did her pediatric residency at Monmouth Medical Center in New Jersey. She went on to complete her pediatric pulmonary fellowship at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Lasso has been with us at the University of Maryland Children's Hospital since 2006. Dr. Lasso, the floor is yours. Thank you, good evening. I am going to try my slides. I think I have control of the mouse, yes. So this is a quick talk and I hope that I will um, give you enough information that you can review later, but really the idea was to touch on a topic that we all are very familiar with um, and give you an update in the current times, um, hopefully a clinical update that can be useful in treating patients. Um, I do not have anything to disclose for this lecture. Um, we'll review quickly in the lecture some of the basics of asthma the burden, particularly for children, disparities, diagnostics, tools for assessment of asthma severity, and treatment. 
And then we'll get a little bit more into the details of the 2020 focus updates to the asthma management guidelines and ending with a little bit of a conversation on asthma and COVID-19 in children and adolescents. So why are we talking about asthma? Um, as we all know, asthma is extremely common. Um, many, many people have asthma. Um, it is said that Beethoven um, had asthma, Pink has asthma, uh, Javali Maggi, um, just to name a few. Um, it's, it's extremely common, but we're still um, learning a lot about it. And it's a condition that we really have to improve um, our ability to control um, because it causes so much disease and so much impairment. Globally, more than 300 million people have asthma based on 2019, 2016 data. It is the most common chronic childhood disease worldwide. And it is not just a public health problem for high income countries like we once thought. It, in fact, 80% of asthma deaths occur in low to middle um, income countries. And globally, we think that asthma is really underdiagnosed and undertreated, causing substantial burden to individuals and families worldwide. In the US, based on the same database, um, about 25 million Americans have asthma. About $50 billion are spent annually in hospitalizations and missed work days. And about nine people die of asthma daily here in the United States. For pediatric patients, 9% of kids, between 8 and 9% of kids are thought to have asthma. It is the most common chronic condition in children in the US as well. And it is the third ranking cause of hospitalizations for US kids. It is also a condition that is affected by significant disparities. And so we think that women, young adults, black, Hispanics, less educated people, and those with lower income tend to have a higher risk of disease and have more severe disease. Um, black adults are known to um, be more likely to die, two to three times more likely to die due to asthma. And it is said that one in four Blacks and one in seven Hispanic adults cannot afford their asthma medications. But what is it? You know, um, basically, as we all know, <clears throat> the general definition is that it is a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways. However, the longstanding debate is whether <clears throat> asthma is a single disease or, um, or a disease that has variable presentation, if you will, one disease with variable presentation versus multiple diseases that have airplay obstruction as their common feature. We personally, and in pediatric pulmonary, I would say, generally speaking, think that asthma is really an umbrella term, that it is a complex disease, perhaps multiple complex diseases that present with recurrent episodes of bronchial obstruction and heightened you know, reactivity that present in different, um, the caused by different molecular pathways, um, endotypes, it present with different clinical phenotypes. What do we know today about it? So we do know, we still think that airway inflammation leads to hyper-responsiveness with increased response to triggers. Um, I apologize because my errors are out of place, but the idea is that hyper-responsiveness causes obstruction um, that is usually reversible, and that this is what causes symptoms, the symptoms that we know typically to be characteristic of asthma, like cough, wheezing, shortness of breath. Um, one of the concepts that we explain and talk about is that we do think that symptoms are easily appreciated, but inflammation can occur prior to symptom development. So it's something that we need to treat um, even in patients that are not having daily symptoms. We do know that asthma triggers are many, um, allergens, upper respiratory infections, changes in weather, cold air, exercise, irritants, 
even strong emotions can be um, a cause of an asthma flare. We also know that asthmatics can have chronic changes in their bronchial biopsies. And to the upper right, um, you can see a biopsy of an individual without asthma versus the biopsy of an asthmatic subject. One concept that's perhaps a little bit newer is that airway obstruction in asthma is perhaps not always reversible, and that there is potentially a um, flow of disease that goes from what we traditionally consider asthma to more of a chronic bronchitis picture all the way down to a COPD-like disease that perhaps explains the COPD that we see in some non-smoking patients. We do know that there's many factors that affect asthma control. Access to care, inhaler technique, environmental exposures, comorbid conditions, adherence to medications, and of course, socioeconomic factors. Let's get now a little bit more into the current asthma phenotypes or how we think of asthma today. So I'll talk a little bit more in detail about each, but basically we divide them in four, an eosinophilic type, a neutrophilic type, a posigromocytic type and a mixed inflammatory type. The eosinophilic type is what we traditionally consider allergic asthma. It's seen in about 40 to 60 percent of asthmatics. Um, patients with this type of asthma tend to have increased eosinophils in their sputum and also in their blood and tend to have a high level of um, nitric oxide in their breath. There, it is associated with type, type two, T2 inflammation and tends to respond to our standard therapy for asthma with inhaled corticosteroids. Neutrophilic asthma is less common, affecting about a quarter of asthmatics, tends to have a predominance of neutrophils in their induced sputum, um, there is no correlation in the species between the degree of neutrophils in their sputum and their blood neutrophils. Unfortunately, this type of asthmatic doesn't tend to respond well to therapy with inhaled corticosteroids and tends to have more severe disease with worse control. There's then the type where um, basically there's less cells. Um, it affects between 17 and 48% of asthmatics is called posigoronocytic because these patients have less than 61% neutrophil counts and less than two eosinophils per um, field. And these patients so, um, tend to be easy to control. And the last type is the more severe type that tends to have both cell types on sputum and tends to have more defect more difficult disease, more difficult to control disease than single cell types alone. Now, when we think of asthma, the way I'd like to think of asthma is that we should focus on it as what do we do for those patients when they're in their outpatient settings where we should base our management and guidelines. Um, and then obviously the inpatient setting that should be pathway based and that has to address what to do with patients when they get to the emergency room or when they, or when they are admitted. Um, this lecture focuses more on the outpatient setting, and so that's what we'll do is talk a little bit more now about the guidelines and the focus updates um, that came out in publication in 2020. So when we think of asthma guidelines, um, the first guidelines came out in 1991, with updates in 1997, 2002, and 2007. Um, there has been also an international effort called the Global Initiative for Asthma that came out in 2015 with an update in 2020. Um, and then now what we're going to focus most on um, during this lecture, the update 2020 to the expert panel report that included a literature search uh, with studies published by 2018. So what I'll mention now is um, going a little bit more into that. I wanted to remind everybody that, as you know, um, we have two types of asthma medications, if you will, our quick 
relief medications that are used for as needed rescue use and our control medications that tend to be preventive and anti-inflammatory. And there is now also new medications that are available for poorly controlled asthmatics that are not responding to standard therapy. Um, you have the list there, but basically um, we have omalizumab, which is an anti-IgE monoclonal antibody. We have three anti-IL-5 monoclonal antibody medications, and we have dupilumab, which is an anti-IL-4 receptor antagonist. Um, which basically blocks IL-4 and IL-13, and is also approved for atopic dermatitis. Now, as a reminder, when we think of asthma management in the outpatient world, we should remember that we have the option and should think of pulmonary function when we have difficulty controller, controlling the situation or for diagnosis. And we should also think of our questionnaires to assess symptomatology, um, perhaps the most used, the ACT or asthma control test that is available for different age groups and allows for patients and their caregivers to give us an idea um, in scores of their symptoms with a score of more than 19 being considered um, good control. Spacers, um, I just touched on this quickly. I wanted to remind you that spacers slow particle velocity, and that minimizes the quantity of the drug that impacts the oropharynx. Um, it also allows for particles that are too large for long delivery to settle out, minimizing the quantity of the drug that impacts the oropharynx and decreases basically the amount of medicine that's swallowed. Um, most patients also whistle when there is an excessive inhalation rate or patient is breathing too fast, if you will. So that reminds the patient to slow down the rate of inhalation, decreasing the, the position of the medicine on the oropharynx. Um, when we think of spacers versus nebulizers, um, basically we think that spacers are more effective in terms of decreasing hospitalization. They're also portable. They actually have been shown to improve the clinical score compared to nebulizers in the emergency room, and they decrease um, side effects like increased respiratory rate and heart rate um, for patients on bronchodilators, likely because of reduced um, swallowing. So the good news to summarize this section is that we have um, anti-inflammatory therapy, and we still use it, the guidelines still recommend it, and basically they're um, good, if you will, for the majority of the patients. Um, the only thing is that we don't think that therapy in asthma changes the natural course of the disease. So what we think happens is that we're controlling the situation where the patients take their medicines, but it's not a long-term effect. So adherence is extremely important. As a reminder, antibiotics do not have a role in asthma management. And in fact, if a patient is responding to antibiotics, it is likely that the condition is another and we need to reevaluate our diagnosis. Now let's get into more of the details of what the focus update um, brings to the picture. So this was published, as I said, in December of 2020. It is a large document with 322 pages. It is um, very detailed, but I'll try to give you an overview of what they um, talk about. So they rely on the previous guidelines where they helped us classify asthma severity based on the um, frequency, if you will, of symptoms and the risk or the impairment of the patient. So it is important to think of asthma the same way we used to think of it, as intermittent or persistent, and within the persistent category, to think of it as mild, moderate, or severe. And this is based on symptoms and lung function. 
as a reminder, because I do think this is important and it's something that's helpful to me, is to think that anybody who requires two or more courses of systemic steroids per year should be categorized as having persistent asthma. Um, and so I think this is useful um, because sometimes it's a little bit hard to get into the details of all the symptoms. Now, this is a little bit more kind of a perhaps a little bit easier to follow, but basically the same idea that you classify patients in intermittent or persistent and within the persistent, mild, uh, moderate, or severe. Um, this slide is addressing the fact that if a patient is having symptoms that suggest poor control, that you should think if they're taking their control appropriately before you make any changes. And if they're not, to then go ahead and retrain the family, if you will, on how to do it properly. If they are, but then you consider stepping up their therapy and keeping them on that level for a good two to three months before you reassess how they're doing. It is important in red here, like we said, when we're thinking of appropriate therapy to check adherence, their inhaler technique, is there new environmental factors or comorbid conditions that might make the patient more difficult to control than before. Now, the updates to the 2020 guidelines were basically six. They address phenol use. Um, this is the fraction of exhaled nitric oxide. They um, made recommendations regarding remediation of indoor allergens and asthma management. They talked about, about adjustable medication dosing. They recommend that they made recommendations on long acting anti muscarinic agents as add on therapy. They talked about immunotherapy and they talked about bronchial thermoplasty in adult severe asthma. Now we'll go into each one of them, um, but basically what they said is that this fractional exhaled nitric oxide measurement is not recommended for children zero to four. Um, they also did not recommend it in isolation, so not, should not be used as a single test to assess asthma control or to predict exacerbations in the long term um, or even to assess severity. So as a single test is not useful. They did suggest that it could be an adjunct to therapy and it could help also as an adjunct um, in terms of the evaluation of a patient, particularly if the patient was difficult to assess and if patient having symptoms that could be um, confused with other diseases. Um, and the table here gives us an idea of the levels that should be considered um, elevated. So I will um, leave the slides with you guys and you'll have access to them later. Um, as Cassie said, with the link. So I hope to go through them in a pretty quick fashion, but that you can hopefully later um, recheck and um, pay attention to some of the details. So allergen mitigation was basically um, not recommended unless the individual was sensitized. So it should not be recommended as a standard approach to asthma care. So we should definitely not be recommending to remove carpets, um, to cover pillows, to cover mattresses, unless the patients are known to be symptomatic when exposed to indoor allergens, and that this is confirmed by history or allergy testing. And it should not be used as a single um, single approach, if you will, but it should really be part of a multi-component allergen mitigation intervention. Now, this is the slide probably that's the most important for most of us clinicians um, because it also has most of the changes. So um, here, when they talk about inhaled corticosteroids, they, um, first thing I will mention is that they talked about something that is been used but has not been approved before, which is that you can start a patient on an inhaled corticosteroid 
course for seven days at the beginning of symptoms that are known to cause a flare of their asthma. So for example, if a patient is known to get in trouble with colds, that you might start that patient on an inhale corticosteroid course for seven days at the first signs of a cold. And that then you add a short acting bronchodilator later, like albuterol, if they develop symptoms. And the degree of um, the evidence is pretty high for this. And this is particular to the zero to four age group. Um, they talk about in patients 12 and older with mild persistent asthma that they may do either or they might either be recommended to be on a daily low dose of inhaled corticosteroid or use as needed in inhaled corticosteroids with a short acting bronchodilator. So basically you either put your patient on a daily controller like you normally would have, or you might leave them on no daily medicine, but add an inhaled corticosteroid with a short acting bronchodilator when they develop symptoms or they start with symptoms related to the trigger. For example, again, with a cold. They said that individuals four years and older, um, they couldn't find enough data to support this. So they recommended against short-term increased corticosteroids for that group, unless compliance was an issue. So like the other two groups, where they actually recommended it. In this group, they did not recommend it unless they felt uh, that you know compliance was an issue. So then in that group, then you could think about it, but they didn't find that it was, they had low um, confidence in that recommendation. And another thing that I thought was really important and very different from what we have been doing is that individuals four years and older who have moderate to severe asthma can use an inhaled corticosteroid with formoterol. Um, the commercial name for this is Symbolport um, or generics for this, but basically that they could do this for daily control and as reliever therapy so that you could use the same medication for both for daily control or prevention and increasing the dose for acute flares so that you could use one medication for everything. Long acting, Muscarinic antagonists um, were recommended um, as part of this guideline update as an additional drug for individuals 12 and older who are already on an inhaled corticosteroid with a long acting bronchodilator. So, for patients who are already on combination therapy, they did not recommend it for patients who are on inhaled corticosteroids alone. Um, so LAMA should not be added instead of a long-acting bronchodilator, um, but in addition to. Immunotherapy or allergy shots as we know them uh, were recommended in the subcutaneous form um, for individuals five years and above who have mild to moderate allergic asthma that's already controlled. So if the patient it has well-controlled asthma and but are pretty atopic, immunotherapy in the subcutaneous form was recommended in addition to their other therapy. Um, they did not recommend the sublingual form of immunotherapy. And bronchial thermoplasty that I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with because it's not something we tend to recommend in pediatrics is sometimes recommended in the adult world. Um, overall basically was not recommended. Um, in these guidelines. They did say that in some cases with very severe asthma where the patients were interested in kind of short-term benefit that it could be considered, but they warned that very little was known in terms of the long-term um, effects of this therapy on the airway. So as a general statement, they did not recommend it. Now the next three slides are basically um, putting kind of what I talked about into the context of how to treat patients based on the guidelines. Um, and it goes zero to four, um, five to 11, and more than 12. Like you guys, I'm sure know, this PEP therapy tends to be hard to memorize. It's best to, in my view, 
to get back to it later and perhaps even take a picture of each one of those three slides so that you can have them for your reference. Because basically the idea is that once you know where your patient is, you know, is your patient an intermittent patient or is your patient a patient with persistent symptoms um, that has to be labeled as persistent asthma. And then based on that um, kind of assessment, then you decide what therapy to do. And then the guidelines gave you then what they suggest. So like I said, for example, just an, as an example here, before we would have said in this step, just PRN albuterol or PRN short acting bronchodilator. Now they're saying that plus to consider the addition of an inhale corticosteroid for seven days at the start of symptoms. So there's a little bit of a change of approach, uh, perhaps we're a little bit more proactive at treating with inhaled corticosteroids than we were before, and there's data to support that. Um, so like I said, I'm not gonna go into each one of the steps, but each one of the three, um, three uh, groups, age groups has one of the stable um, that incorporates what the update um, gave us into the stepwise um, approach to asthma care. And this is 12 years and older. So now I definitely want to remind everybody that when we think of effectiveness for medication, we need to think of um, really the factors that affect adherence because effectiveness is the combination, if you will, of efficacy and adherence. Um, and adherence is impacted by many factors. Um, for example, is the medication oral or inhaled, the dosing frequency, the side effects, the cost of the medicine, patient education, onset of action, inhaler technique, um, all of those can make a big impact on how much a patient takes their medicine. And of course, if the patient doesn't take the medicine, then obviously that will impact how effective the medicine is. Now, switching to our last talk, Topic, so we have some time for um, questions. This is um, just giving you a little bit of background on COVID-19 burden in the US um, recently in children. So this is data from just the last month, basically, um, where we can see that about 13% of all US cases of COVID um, have been pediatric patients. There's been about 14,000 hospitalizations for um, kids and 292 deaths. Um, so it's important to realize that this data might be underreported, but it is important to, to think of this as um, COVID causing definitely some pediatric disease that is significant. When we think of asthma and COVID in particular, and we now focus on that, there is really not much on the topic. Um, the CDC stated looking at 345 cases um, where they saw that 11% of the children that had chronic conditions had chronic lung diseases, including asthma. So basically lumping all chronic lung disease um, in one category. So we don't know enough about how much asthma has been the predisposing factor for admissions to the hospital um, for these kids. And in a New York hospital report, they talked about a quarter of their kids with um, COVID, admissions for COVID having asthma. What we do know and think right now is that asthma during the pandemic has been behaving differently than it has in other years. And overall, we're seeing just less asthma admissions. And I think you all will agree on that, that we're just not having the number of admissions that we normally would have um, during the winter or now springtime. And um, perhaps this is due to multiple um, factors, but 
um, some might need more study, but kind of at a glance, what we think is that perhaps kids are less exposed. Schools have been closed for a very long time. Many schools have been. Um, patients have been less exposed to other patients, to other people. Um, they have been, in general, less exposed to the outdoors until more recently, perhaps, where we're opening a little bit more. But for a long time, people have been less exposed. There's been less physical activity. Um, there's been perhaps more indoor air exposure and allergens exposure that way for indoor allergens. Um, there's been different, different, a different kind of mode, if you will, for how we live. So lots of different um, triggers and less triggers in some areas than others. Um, the other thing that is potentially impacting what we're doing is that we're doing also a lot of telehealth. And perhaps that is helping us manage our patients somewhat better than before. Um, so there's been decreased outpatient visits, but also decreased emergency visits for asthma. To finish, basically wanted to give you an overview that we should definitely think of inhaled corticosteroids still today as the preferred control of medication that management should be individualized and it's a partnership between the family and the health care provider, that we need to keep regular follow-up and assessment of our patients and that in this new world, telemedicine might have a significant role in this um, condition, that we need to step up care when needed, but to wait at least three months before we step down um, to make sure patients are controlled, that we need to always write our action plans, our instructions for our patients, and keep on going education, and utilize state and local resources for asthma, evaluate down asthma education and patient care. And in the year of COVID, Regina guidelines, or Google Initiative Asthma Guidelines, that we continue our patients under controllers, um, that we keep them, if they're on biologics, under biologics, that if they're on steroids, we keep them under steroids, that we treat exacerbations of asthma as we normally would, including using systemic steroids if needed, and that we refer parents and hopefully children soon for COVID vaccination. Um, in fact, I just heard a lecture today that there may be um, availability of the vaccine for pediatric patients as early as this summer. Um, so with that, I will um, leave you for questions and um, hope that the summary and the overview is helpful um, in that if you have any questions, um, I'm open for them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lasso. Now we will go to Aaron for questions in the chat box. Okay, great, thank you. Please enter your questions now and Dr. Lasso will answer them. We do have one comment from um, Dr. Lala. So, um, hi, Dr. Lasso. You see a lot of my patients from Dr. Lala. It's it's very nice to. It's a little weird. I will say that I can't see anybody. So, I'm glad that you said hi. Great. Are the, um. We don't seem to have any questions at this time. Uh, please submit them right now. Okay, I guess there are no questions. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Lasso, for your time. Um, and to please, oh, here we go. I take that back. Um, so for, this is again from Dr. Lala. Um, if I understand it clearly, those with intermittent asthma less than four years, um, those with intermittent asthma less than four years, we should give ICS. 
for seven days. Uh, should get ICS-4? Can you read that part? Of course. If I understand clearly, those with intermittent, intermittent asthma less than four years, we should give ICS for seven days. Right. Yes. I think that that's actually one of the biggest, the two things that I took from this update that were very different from my practice is that yes, if a patient, um, they said that they found enough data to support this approach in kids less than four and over 12. That kids between 11, five and 11, they didn't find enough data, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't work for them. It just means that there wasn't enough data for them to recommend it. So, um, but for the groups where they found enough data, which are zero to four and more than 12, they uh, recommended use of seven days of an inhaled steroid. Um, they proposed somewhere in the, in the 322 pages that you could do something like budesonide uh, one gram twice a day for seven days. So that would be nebulized um, budesonide. I personally don't use a lot of nebulized steroids. Um, so I personally would do something like buticazone uh, or beclometazone, which is Q-bar. Um, but the point is that you can give them an inhaled steroid at the beginning of their symptoms before they develop symptoms, meaning if they have a congested nose, for example, from a cold that you could start it right then and then give them seven days of that. If they develop symptoms, you add albutrol, if that, if that makes sense. And then the other thing I forgot to, to say that the other thing that I thought was very different from what I've been doing is the use of um, Symbocort basically, or it's generic as a daily medicine plus a PRN medicine so that you could keep your moderate to severe asthmatic in this medicine. And then when developing symptoms, escalating the frequency of the dose so that they can also use it as a rescue medicine. Thank you, Dr. Lasso. Is that also correct for children between the ages of four and 12? So the guidelines tend to, to divide their, their patients in zero to four, five to 11, and more than 12. So what they said, the problem with this type of guideline is that they won't commit if they don't find enough data. So they were able to, to give us pretty good data for less than four and more than 12. So it's up to you guys and to me to decide what to do with the group in between. So if you ask me, I think I would say that I'm gonna use this mode for everybody. You know, I, I think that clinically, clearly there isn't enough data for the 5 to 11, um, but, you know, logically speaking, it kind of makes sense that if you are able to do it for less than four and over 12, that, you know, that's going to be my practice um, starting now, basically. Thank you. Can you speak a little bit about um, Symbacort and the dosage? So for some record, as you guys know, is two pots twice a day, um, and we use it with a spacer. So in this in this form, you'd be doing that for daily use, but then you would be increasing the dose during flares. So you'd be doing something like Q6 hours, so two plus Q6, or <laughs> so, you know, something like that. I, I personally need to kind of. Um, I haven't done this before, so I, I don't have experience with it. I've never used it like that. It's been actually proposed by the GINA guidelines as well. So the international guidelines did the same thing. So both guidelines that came out in 2020 um, are saying the same thing. Um, my concern, I will tell you, is that I don't know if insurances will pay for this form of use, because um, Simbocort has been marketed as a medication that has enough puffs for daily use. But if you start having somebody do PRN use, you're going to use their inhalers quicker. Um, so I guess, you know, food for thought. Um, I think we might run into a little bit of trouble getting insurance coverage for this approach. Um, but hopefully we can convince them that, I mean, it's definitely part of the 
Great, thank you. Are there any more questions? Great. All righty. Well, again, Dr. Lasso, thank you so much for presenting this morning, this evening. Um, this will, con will conclude our webinar. Thank you all for joining us, and we hope that you will be able to join us for our next webinar on Thursday, May 13th at 6 p.m., when Dr. Lasso will be discussing obst obstructive sleep apnea in children. When is snoring a problem? Thank you again for attending, and have a great rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.